and he's going to introduce our speaker. Okay, hey, welcome. I'm happy you're all here today in Logan, and those of you that are on the regional campuses, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'd like to also welcome our uh, dean, the dean of the Huntsman School of Business, uh, Doug Anderson, is with us tonight. We had a nice visit with him earlier. We're very excited, though, to have Susan Johnson with us tonight. Um, I've known about Susan from a distance for a while, and I've just become so impressed with what she's done at Futura Industries. Uh, Susan is the president of Futura Industries. It's located in Clearfield, Utah, many of you know. And Futura delivers uh, customized, it's really start to finish, uh, aluminum extrusion services. And one of the things that they're really known for is phenomenal customer service, that they, they strive for a high level of excellence, so every customer gets excellent results. They're also known as just a great place to work, a really hospitable place to work. They uh, are very, very productive. They produce a strong bottom line. And Susan has been acknowledged for her success with this company uh, on many fronts. I just want to mention a few of the war, uh, awards for Susan and the company. In 2006, uh, Susan was recognized as Cal Poly's College of Engineering Outstanding Alumni of the Year. So she's a graduate in engineering from Cal Poly University. In 2007, Susan received the Utah Manufacturers Association Business Executive of the Year, of the Year Award. In 2009, Futura received the Award of Merit from the Utah Safety Council. And here's the latest one. In 2010, Futura was honored with the Alfred P. Sloan Award for Business Excellence and Workplace Flexibility. So a lot of honors. There are many more that I could review with you. Uh, before Futura, Susan was the president of Savage Manufacturing Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Mack Truck. Uh, as I mentioned, she received a bachelor's degree in engineering from Cal Poly <coughs> University. She also attended graduate school at UC Irvine and Santa Clara College. Um, Futura, if you look on the website, is very interested in giving back to the community and you'll see many things that they're involved with. But Susan also personally is, is very involved in giving back. Uh, she currently serves here at Utah State University on the Board of Trustees. She's on the Board of Directors for Zion's First National Bank, and she has served as the chair of the Utah State University College of Engineering Advisory Board. Uh, Susan, I hope she, you don't mind me mentioning this, but she wasn't feeling well this morning, and so we exchanged some emails, and, and she wanted to come. And I'm very impressed that uh, she knew that she was on the schedule and she'd made the commitment she wanted to come here and speak to us tonight. So it's just an honor to have with us Susan Johnson tonight. Thank Thanks very much. So um, you can hear okay, not too loud. I spent last Friday and Monday in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, lecturing in the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And I think... Um, the plane coming home to Salt Lake City, this is a very surprising thing, but it had a lot of children on it. And um, I, I, there were a lot of sick kids. And yesterday I started to think, man, do I have bad allergies? And this morning I thought, oh, this is way worse than allergies. But you've had this schedule put together for such a long time. I thought, okay, I've just got to rally. And, and usually, I mean, I'm going to be pretty enthusiastic and passionate, but, you know, I may not be up to my normal self. Um, People say that CEOs have power, uh, but do they? I don't believe that they have any power that's not given to them by their organization. And that may be a little bit of a foreign thought, especially to our business students, our MBAs, because they're looking forward to having the power to do things, change things. And yet, uh, they have responsibility but again, I would need to say that my belief is they don't have power. Now, in dysfunctional organizations, all right, I'm going to be a little bit stuck behind the counter here, I think. No? OK. In, in uh, dysfunctional organizations, I believe that you get Self-interest driven voluntary compliance. But that's a lot different than having your heart and soul in a company. And I do believe that companies that have, oh, this is annoying. Companies that have great cultures, uh, this is what the people believe. If anybody's gone to the post office at 
I don't know, closing time, 4.29, um, and tried to get service from the postal service, um, you often get, well, it's quitting time, or that's not my job, so I'm not going to do it. Or sometimes you even get a dear soul who will say, well, I will help you even though it's not my job. For the last five years or so, we have had a tenant at Futura that we've been pushing very heavily, and that is, we do it because it's my company. And in fact, what, how come you have on a Futura t-shirt there? Did you work for us? Turn, oh, do you have one of our It's Our Company shirts? But you know that what I'm saying is true, that we have fostered a belief throughout our company that I do it because it's my company. Now, is it literally their company? No. Um, our company's been a business for 78 years, so although your series has been entrepreneurial in nature, um, we were, we've been entrepreneurial since day one, 78 years ago. We were started by a very interesting man named Frank Hobbs. He had a little business in Seattle, Washington. And during World War II, he noticed these Quonset huts being shipped across the country and moved to ships and, and sent up to uh, Alaska for our troops to live in. And he thought to himself, wow, these look really heavy. And they've had to ship them all the way across the country. So in about three weeks, he put together a model of a Quonset hut that was, was revolutionary in that it was easily assembled, it was lightweight. He developed an esprit de corps in that company where they were producing one about every two hours. He went to the army and eventually got a contract for all of them and ended up making a tremendous amount. He looked around and said, you know, I used some aluminum extrusions in this project. Aluminum extrusions were fairly new at this point in time. It was, an, it was a process, a manufacturing process that had come along associated with World War II. And he said, I want to own one of those companies. So he um, started us. And then some years ago, a man named Bob Hansberger, who was the chairman of board and the founder of Boise Cascade Corporation, a true entrepreneur who hired me, um, was putting together a little suite of companies for his own ownership because uh, he wanted to have uh, his own group of companies that weren't driven by the need to, for stockholder results every quarter. And he's owned us that for 50 years. But that, that was just a little digression. I just really believe that the best leaders get to the heart and soul of the people that work in the companies. And um, Margaret Mead said, She said that, you know, never believe that a few caring people can't change the world, but I would change that to say never doubt that a group of determined, well-respected, valued, and loved people can create great companies um, and great outcomes and great results. And in my opinion, that's all that ever has. There's a lot of companies out there, but um, there aren't that many where the heart and soul of everybody that works there is engaged. Now, a little bit about this presentation. Uh, when Michigan asked me if I'd come out and talk, they said, now we use Prezi here, and we don't allow anybody on campus with PowerPoint. So we th it's a web-based presentation system that's supposed to, it, it kind of emulates a pathway of results. But um, I'm having to go over here because it's web-based and we can't do the clicker from out there. So bear with me, and I, I hope it's not too distracting. You know, we talk about great schools. That's a great school. We talk about great companies. That's a great company. Um, but uh, I plan to talk about what makes them great, what makes companies great, what makes people engaged. I'd like to talk about how I've gotten to where I am today. When I graduated from college a um, long time ago, I had basically worked in manufacturing companies my entire career. And people will often ask me, you know, how do you build a great company? Oftentimes you get the impression they're actually looking for a recipe. They want to know. They will say, oh, you must have a daycare. Like, no, no daycare. Well, you must have this. No, it's not a plug-in solution. Basically, we have a great company because I never forgot what the companies look like from the bottom up. And that's what I will say is the number one secret of building a great company. That 
when you're in the bowels of the company, when you're an engineering intern like you were last summer, um, or a brand new engineer, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of opinions you derive by looking upward at how the company behaves, how the company treats you, how the company treats its competitors, how the company treats its customers, and those lessons taken to heart have led me to do a lot of things that are very contrary to the way traditional businesses operate. I've worked in some of the largest defense contractors in the country, and I've worked in a steel foundry. I was a plant manager in the largest steel foundry on the West Coast. And saw a lot of things that I filed away as, you know, I think I'll just do that differently if I have a chance someday. So I want to share the world of uh, Futura and aluminum extrusions with you tonight. We're going to take a little tour. Now the gentleman leading the tour is our vice president of operations, and this movie was made a, a while ago, a couple years ago. We've changed a bit, but most everything is still very applicable. Everything that we do here at Futura Industries is centered around continuous improvement. We strive to provide the highest levels of quality, shortest lead time, and the lowest possible cost. We've been extremely successful in accomplishing this due to the high caliber of individuals that work here, who continually shape what we consider is a world-class culture. We invite you to take a short tour with us today so that you can witness firsthand how the application of lean manufacturing in the hands of a strong culture is a recipe for success for your business as well as ours. Let's start our tour today at the heart of our process, in the extrusion area. You know, one unique aspect of Futura Industries is that our extrusion teams and die shops are fully integrated. The majority of our die technicians have worked on our press teams for years, and so they have an understanding of flow dynamics as well as the press parameters. That makes them all the more effective in performing their functions as die technicians. One press team member spends an entire shift pulling, cutting, and recording samples, constantly monitoring dimensions, weight per foot, and surface finish for nominal conditions before the product is stretched. Our press teams are in constant communication throughout the entire process, assuring material meets all required expectations before the materials advance to the next operation. This is our anodizing process. Here we offer a wide range of colors and finishes to meet your applications and needs. We do all of this internally so that you don't have to manage multiple vendors, and you get the same quality and service all throughout the process. We have excellent process control here with trained line technicians who perform pH calculations and titrations all throughout their shift to assure nominal conditions for our tank parameters. This is the fabrication area of our plant. Here we do a lot of precision sawing and punching applications. You'll notice a lot of lean tools applied in this area as well. Here on this machine we have what we call autonomous maintenance. That is step-by-step -step instructions that help an operator to check the lube, reservoirs, and other simple tasks for a particular machine. We also have a shadow board that's right at the point of use. When the operator has the tools right at the point of use, that translates to a shorter lead time and a lower price for you. In our machining area, every process we undertake, from drilling to milling, threading to boring, is completed with precise attention to your specifications. So your product can be shipped straight from our plant to your dock without any worries or concerns about quality. When your product's ready to be shipped, we offer everything from quality assurance to customized packaging. It's all part of who we are here at Futura and our commitment to you to offer the highest levels of service and quality possible. Now, we're going to watch another very short video, but one of the interesting things before we watch that is that we've been selected for 12 years in a row as the best company to work at in Utah by the Governor's Office of Economic Development. But you can see oh, clearly through this video, it's not a glamorous environment. We work um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 355 days a year, and um, the folks that work there work hard. So. What we're talking about tonight is important. How have we engaged the hearts and mind? How, how, how do we 
no. The people that work there are making thousands of decisions a day that affect our customers' products and services, and yet you can't possibly supervise all of that into your organization. You have to build it in. Now, this video is about a non-traditional market that we got into about 10 years ago. This is called T-slots. We literally get probably 50 hits from universities around the country every day on this particular website. We get an average of 2,800 hits, but the universities were assuming that they're hitting on this to use it in their projects. My name is Matt Mickelson, and I'm a senior mechanical engineer. I had a project that required a lightweight, precision-built structure that could withstand the applied buckling and bending stresses. When reviewing all the options, the best choice was to use T-Slots. Not only is T-Slots the fastest growing structural aluminum supplier, but we offer the most consistent product and the most extensive offering in the industry. Extrusion is taking and converting the raw material into a finished product. We do all of that in-house. The advantage that that offers us is that some of our competitors bring their material in from other suppliers, and so they don't have that control, quality, or surface finish. We created T-Slots to be the building blocks of your ideas. Working with T-Slots is as simple as inserting a T-nut and fastener into an extrusion and tightening. You get a durable, strong, lightweight structure that's both functional and attractive. We sell our T-Slots through distributors. One thing that they really like about our product is that we are the meal and control the quality as well as offer a wide variety of finishes. T-Slots is probably one of our fastest growing products. We cannot afford any margin of error when working with machinery. The machinery has to do the same thing over and over and over again. And any small problem compounds into a bigger problem. Because these slots are extruded in-house, the quality starts from the beginning. T-slots are the only T-slotted aluminum extrusion produced and sold by the extruder, giving you the best value for your budget. We also give you the most consistent product and the most extensive offering in the industry, including fractional, Bosch compatible, and metric. These slots come in a variety of sizes with standard hardware and brackets. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> that particular machine that was built out of T-slot that we had some photos of, that machine was producing 3,000 solar panel frames a day. So um, we were producing the four sides of the frames, and because it's so cost competitive, uh, trying to bring solar in line with coal and with uh, um, natural gas, <coughs> the solar manufacturers are putting a lot of pressure on getting costs down. We were able to do that by building that machine. I want to talk a little bit about our source of differentiation, which um, I'm sure you've talked about. But So our market position, these are some shots off our website. And basically, what we're saying is that by saying, I am Futura, every single individual in our company is highly involved in the production of, of or in getting your products and services to you and getting them right. The next one is do it right the first time. So that says two-tenths of 1% returns in 2009. And last year we had one-tenth of 1% 1 returns in 2009, which has given us a tremendous source of competitive advantage in the market. Because there's a lot of extruders. It's part of, our, it's part of our offering, our brand. High tolerances. We often take work that other extruders won't because uh, 
we challenge ourselves to learn and um, acquire new skills all the time. And then finally, lean manufacturing. We've been on the lean pathway for quite a while. The thing about the lean pathway is that, boy, it sure seems like you're further away from the goal every year that passes. And I guess that's part of the whole thing. But we've got less people today in our plant than we had when we were one-third the revenue we are today. Again, another source of competitive advantage. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the three markets. So we have three basic markets we sell. Floor covering metal is the first one. It's a, it's a very exciting market, and it's what the recruiter that called me to ask me to come to the company really cited as the reason I should go there, that this company was the leader in carpet and ceramic tile trims. I was like, well, that's pretty exciting, I guess. But um, what else are we doing? Well, we also sell OEMs. And you all know what OEMs are? Original equipment manufacturers. So those are people that make things. We sell to everything from John Deere to Precor, you name it. And then the third is the T-slot market. So. Uh, Let's look a little bit at who we sell. Where do our products go? First of all, um, Western Star is one of our Class 8 trucks that we build for. We also are the only supplier worldwide, as we are for this, for all Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks. So all those Kenworth trucks you see with the square grill on the front and those lines down the front, they came from Clearfield, Utah. So if you were in South Africa and saw one of those, Clearfield, Utah. We ship them all over the world every single day, and they go straight to their assembly line. Now, what's interesting about Western Star, for those of you who know a lot about Class 8 trucks, this is the real 800-pound um, gorilla. So the truck drivers that can afford to 100% specify their own trucks, they buy Western Star. For the suppliers, that means it's kind of a nightmare, because this grill right here, 78 versions of that grill. Now, that, that, that is not... They don't have cost savings in mind when they're doing that. Because, so what it means is that we are having to, since we ship these grills directly to their line in order that the trucks are going to come down the line, we ship them in big, reusable containers, truck one, two, three. It's got the VIN of the truck, and it's got the, the model of the grill that's going on. There is not another extruder in this country that would be even interested in this work. So it allows us to um, really excel. We sell OEMs, as I mentioned. This product's pretty interesting, this one right here. So these are put together into a large assembly, and they're using it to stretch the wings of the new Boeing 767 over. These are boat windshields. So anybody that goes um, wakeboarding in the summer, any boat under about 35 feet, bay liner, sea ray, four winds, we have, it's our windshield metal, plus the metal around the outside of the boat. And these are automated pool cover assembly parts. So the vinyl will go in here, and this is part of the roll-up mechanism. I'll talk a little bit later about why we're so diverse, because most extruders have really stuck in one market. And we are diversified across so many that it's almost difficult to numerate them. Um, this is a computer. We're actually building that beautiful blue frame, building it and anodizing it for them. That is the size of the computer, and they're built. See the little slot on the top that you can um, stack them to increase the size? Oh, these are a lot of the brands that we sell. Um, I would imagine around here there's a lot of storm doors. This particular product. So if you went into Home Depot anywhere in the country to buy a storm door, they only sell one brand. It's called Forever by um, Anderson Doors and Windows. And this part that looks like it's nickel or brass, it's aluminum. We make about 5,500 a day of those. And I often think, where do, where do all these storm doors go? It just, it just boggles my mind. Um, Pre-core, you probably recognize that. We make a lot of the parts for their elliptical, for their um, treadmills. A whole bunch of customers that you recognize. We've gotten heavily into the solar industry. This is one of the personal attributes I talk about in just a little bit. Paying attention. That's the number one attribute I think has yielded great results for me personally and in my company. 
Two years ago, we had a supplier visiting us from Germany、um, for a T slot. They sold us some components that go in T slot. But these、uh, people were talking about solar. And again, it, it wasn't a couple of years ago, it was about 10 years ago. And they just kept talking about it and talking about it. When they left, I went to our VP of sales and said, I think we need to dedicate a, at least one sales resort、um, completely to solar, or we called it alternative power at the time. We quickly abandoned the wind because there weren't a lot, we, we just don't see that going anywhere. But solar has taken off tremendously. We're the number one supplier, aluminum supplier, into this industry right now. And、um, the industry is changing rapidly, but it's a good one. Oh, you know, I'm going to give a little example in a bit about bad management, but as long as we're talking about solar, I'll give you a little vignette. So, have you heard of Solyndra? You know, the company that went down and took $500 million or whatever of our tax money with them. Well, they were having us, quote, Solar panel frames. And we had gone through about five iterations where we'd made dyes, we'd produced them, we'd made dyes and produced them. And we decided, you know what, we're going to Fremont, California to visit these guys because we need to know where the beef is. We want an order for frames. And oh my gosh, this company, I could have told you they were going to fail. Because as we got out of the car in the parking lot, now, now mind you, they're beating us on price. Unbelievable. Get out of the parking lot. This was a fab that they had bought from another company that had gone out of business. And we noticed that they are replacing thousands of square feet of glass, blue glass, with blue glass. So we asked our purchasing guy, what's with the glass? Oh, well, we're putting in Solyndra Blue. Solyndra Blue. Okay, now that adds value to the bottom line.、Um, it, <laughs> We, we got in the car and just said, they fingerprinted us, they took photos of us, and three months later they were out of business. We never did sell them. They sent the parts to China. And、um, unfortunately for the Chinese extruders, our industry has been successful in putting、um, a very strong set of tariffs in place with the International Trade Commission. But that, that's just an industry. Noticing everywhere you go little indications about what the culture of the company is like. So, That glass told me they had a little bit of toxicity in their company. Solar? We attend all the international solar shows. And、um, that's a indust- very interesting industry. And I mentioned floor covering. So when I joined the company, we had about 40% market share. And this is ceramic tile trim, these are reducers, this is stair nosing, carpet metal. We recently, in 2008, we bought our largest competitor, who is MD Mecklenburg Duncan out of Oklahoma City. I really concentrated our position in that market, and we've got about 95%. Now, that, interest, that market's really interesting because it's not terribly complicated metal. We actually beat it with chains for the transition.、Um, but the key to the margins in that market, which is our highest margin product, is. Is the distribution channel. So we sell through distributors and we make it our focus to make our distributors successful. We help them manage their cash flow, we help them manage their point of sale、um, promotions. So, again, a little bit different than the normal, just extrude it, put it on a truck, and it's gone. T slots are、uh, currently our largest account in T slots is Kimberly Clark. And you probably recognize that name. It's a very、um, conscientious company. So, they just one of their products are diapers. Diapers are basically made on huge paper machines. They have 33 of them in this country. They're about 200 yards long in length. And they put a complete electromechanical guarding system around these diaper machines to keep the employees' hands out of the machine. He's they, talking about the training at work. Is that me? Okay.、Um, To keep their employees' hands out of the machine in case they, they get clogged up. And、um, we are now making all their equipment guarding around the country and starting to send some to their foreign locations. And they are an exacting customer. So, before I talked about products and plants, I mentioned great schools, great companies. So, how, how do we define great? You know, 
I hope this doesn't sound too capitalistic, but I am in the business building here. I, I think great organizations are defined by great results. What do you guys think about that? We like profit. Yeah. We, 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 uh, profit is the deal. And in fact, um, the key to a vibrant economy is thriving businesses. Because everything gets paid for by taxes. And we need companies that are thriving, that are hiring more people, that are producing great results, great innovation. So we believe that, that great organizations are defined by great results. I'm going to talk today a lot about how we engage our employees. But to me, this is, that, is a, that is a way to get great results. Because the purpose of the organization is to increase shareholder value. That's what we absolutely believe. That's the reason we're in business. Okay, so now I started in 1995. I never intended to stay this long with the company, but we've been doing better and better. We didn't show those results, but I called them the hockey puck years. They were really small. When I joined this company, um, our debt, interest-bearing debt to equity was one. And we had a lot of debt. We weren't um, producing a lot of profits. But I did believe in my heart and soul we could turn that around. And uh, today we have no debt whatsoever, even though we invest heavily in the business. This is our net sales and operating income. Let me go back for just a second. Did you notice this, this line here is the percent operating income as a percent of revenue? So you can see that not only are we making more money, but the amount that operating income represents as a percent of our revenue is growing. So this is another way to look at the same thing. You could see uh, we suffered the same economic catastrophe that everyone else did. Um, however, during this time, half the extruders in our country went out of business. They're gone. Two reasons. They had a lot of debt. Most of them had a lot of debt. When their workflow slowed down, they didn't have the cash flow to service their debt. But by far, the bigger reason was the Chinese. And let me take a little second here. So, um, you know, we're free marketers, but we believe in level playing fields, particularly for non-market economies that decide to join the World Trade Organization. So China produces a five-year plan every year. They're very strategic. And in 1983, they identified aluminum as an industry of interest and began putting a tremendous amount of money in their infrastructure into aluminum. Smelters, they have more smelt... <laughs> now, just wrap your mind around this. They have more smelting capacity than the rest of the... four times more than the rest of the world put together. They have four times more extrusion capacity than the rest of the world put together. Now, granted, they were planning for an explosive growth of their infrastructure, and since aluminum extrusions are used literally everywhere, that was part of it. But part of it is a great need to keep their folks employed. Because people that are employed, that are working, aren't going to be marching on Tiananmen Square. And, and that's fine, I understand their motivation, but um, they were selling aluminum products into this country below the price of the raw material. And um, that just doesn't make sense. So, paying attention, I look at the import numbers every month, the total market net numbers. Oh, we have not been affected that much by the Chinese, but I'm seeing that the amount that was coming from foreign imports was rising, and actually the slope of the line was getting steeper. So I rallied some folks in our industry, the largest extruder in the country, there were four of us, that filed a fair trade action suit um, against the Chinese. I was sent out to raise money to pay for this um, to all the other extruders, because it cost us $3 million to get the lawsuit through our system. We hired a very, very good attorney. 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue kind of gives, um, gives you some sense of their billing rate. But um, how it works is that you have to make a case. There's three things that have to exist. First of all, they have to be 
demonstrating subsidization, meaning their government's paying for their buildings, their land, their equipment. They're being subsidized. Second, you have to prove dumping. And in their case, they even got a bonus from their government for all, every pound of metal they shipped to the US. They got a bonus. So they really didn't care if they were selling at any kind of profit. And third, they had to be injury to the domestic industry. So we had all three tests. It was um, a very interesting process. We had to go to Washington twice to testify before the International Trade Commission. And on our second time of testifying, word had come from Commerce that we had gotten a 407% tariff had been established. Now, that number doesn't come out of the air. That number is developed, and it's meant to, to demonstrate the magnitude of the unbalance between the domestic market and that market. Um, you've all heard of tires. You know that the Chinese tire thing. You've heard of steel. Well, there were 24 industries before us that had taken these moves. And this last December, the Chinese tire manufacturers were finally <laughs> successful, having their case heard in uh, the Federal Court of Appeals in the US, who sided with them. So we had um, 35 days to either go to the Supreme Court or get a legislative solution. And I will tell you, uh, this young man that gave me some chocolates before, he works for <coughs> Senator Hatch. Uh, Senator Hatch is the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee who oversees trade. And believe it or not, we actually got a bill through the Senate and the House, unanimous in the Senate, 309 to 39 in the, Senate, in the House, because, uh, saying that for all of these 25 industries, yes, the tariffs were appropriate. But uh, the systems are, are a little bit cumbersome to work through, but it's certainly worth it in our case. Um, now, every year we send our data to a confidential organization who processes all the financial information from all the extruders in the country um, and gives you back a report. So you can see our net operating income as compared to all and the high. You can see net operating income as a percent of total assets and our gross profit. And the, the gross profit is the stunning one, particularly considering we came through that tremendous downturn. How do you, how do you generate those kind of results? Well, if you've got the heart and mind of every single person that, walk, that works in that plant, and if there's a question at 2 in the morning about a dimension, should I run this part, should I not run this part? Um, we're counting on them to make the right sets of decisions and consistently day in and day out they do. So that culture, the culture is what underpins all of these results. Um, we were, we've been in a, a number of national magazines. That was one of them. Uh, so as a result of hard work, I got through college. You guys work hard. Probably, don't you? And as a result of hard work, I, um, I've gotten to where I am today. But um, I'd like to talk about why. Because when I was first made a company president, when I was 29, um, I, like everybody else, if we're honest with ourselves, had no idea what I was doing, no idea or, nor any idea of what to do. Um, it's a little daunting, because there's so many moving parts. But I now believe that it's been the development of a specific set of traits that basically has led not only to my success, but it has moved our company's success. The beautiful thing about the owners of this company is that I pretty much have to send the search dogs out to get them their attention. They've given over 152% of running this company to me. And I've been able to do some things that in more traditional organizations, I might not have been able to do. For instance, we have our own on-site medical clinic, and it's not the Sniffles Clinic, and it's not if you get hurt at work. It's your primary care physician. We have a Harvard-educated internal med doctor. We have a pediatrician. And I remember calling Boise sometime after the cl clinic was established and saying, oh, and yeah, by the way, we established a medical clinic on site. Hope that's OK. Well, the results have been so great in terms of controlling our health care costs year over year that now they've uh, opened the same model in every one of their companies. And the doctor who started our clinic is now replicating this throughout the state. She just got Sandy City, Salt Lake City, M Mark Miller, 
R.C. Willey, a Vivant, Blendtec, because she is really demonstrating how to deliver outstanding health care for a much, a much set or, a lower set of costs than, than through the traditional system. So the first, uh, the first attribute is pay attention to detail. Um, let me tell you about the first time I came to look at Futura. So these folks had been calling me. A headhunter called me. I had I got married late. I had my children late. I'd come in from hiking. I had my, my uh, oldest son. He's leaving for college this fall on my back in a backpack. And the phone was ringing. And this person started talking. And I said, who are you? I mean, you sound like a headhunter. And uh, I left the state. I changed my name. How'd you find me? And he said, oh, some people in Salt Lake City. So finally, I, mean, I really wasn't that interested in aluminum extrusion industry. It's, it's not the one you've probably all written in your personal journal. My goal is to work for an aluminum extrusion company. <laughs> um, and, and I had the same reaction. But they finally, after about four months, they said, would you just go down to Utah and take a look at this company? Well, I remember when I walked through the door, I thought, they filmed Schindler's List here. <laughs> Nobody would meet my eyes. Everyone I spoke to talked in terms of we and they, and I kept thinking, who's we and who's they? But, but see, I was paying attention to what I was seeing, and to me, that was a big indicator. A lot of us don't pay attention. Think about when you drive to class or drive home. Um, you don't think about that journey, you just do it. So paying attention is a huge personal trait that I believe has very much helped me. We need to make sure that we see, we don't just look. Does that make sense? This is what I saw when I went through that company. Folks, the eyes had it. All I had to do was look in their eyes and know what was up with that company. We need to see, not just to look. And paying attention means also paying attention to the people and giving people more than they expect. Folks that have worked at Futura know that this isn't just lip service. Um, we do it on so many dimensions. The clinic, we just had our 100th dependent graduate from college on a Futura scholarship. Now, everybody has tuition reimbursement, and that's pretty much something you have to have to be competitive. But dependent scholarships? In fact, one of our great maintenance guys' wives graduated from Utah State with a degree in um, landscape architecture. He's had three kids graduate from here. If someone's worrying about how they're going to send their kids through college, then they may be distracted on the job and not do the best job or actually get hurt. Um, it's paid back in spades through Velcroing our employees to us. Um, so giving people more than they expect results in um, high levels of trust. Our clinic that I mentioned, this woman is a pediatrician at uh, Children's Primary who comes to us every day a week. And this is Dr. Donna Milovitz, who graduated from Harvard and wants to change the world. Um, and we basically, every single one of our employees and their extended... Maybe you were about that. That's really, really energy efficient. Yeah, yeah. It's real life. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, the straw house thing? Yeah. yeah. yeah we oh, oh, that's good. Yeah. that TV out there. I know my van broke down. Well, yeah, they don't get too much out of their solar. You and I was there. They don't. It's volt, and it just plugs into one. Can everybody give this guy a round of these handouts here if you didn't get these? They're about three feet by four foot panels. Yeah. It's all right. It's two full 30. I'll have to show up. Whoever got the nerve. Whoever's talking about solar power, your mic's on. I think of brownouts, you know. I think it, you know, giving it 90 volts and everything. TV bar for that. Trying to save money. Yeah, <laughs> no, but the, the inverters and everything, the way it's set up, you're just on the grid RCD anyway. This size. is just supplementary. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay. Maybe they're all our. Everybody, let's yeah. go. This paper that I passed around here is for contractors. Okay. They've given me another paper for electricians. 
So I'm going to pass it around. Cut them out. gave her the time to go out and look at other companies and help them set up systems to save them self money because it goes around comes around. Um, <clears throat> curiosity. I'm going to move a little bit faster. Curiosity is another one of the personal traits. The thing is that they've got 16 core hours. Just ask why, why? I have a personal philosophy, bring data or don't come in, because I don't want to talk anecdotally. It's amazing how much time is spent talking. Well, I think, I think, just let's look at the data. And then you need to define the results you want. Okay, well, look at the data. And the inputs leads you to the what I consider the major trait where it all comes together, and that's alignment, actions and words. We have a lot of things in this section around our mission, our values, but I'm going to go straight to our brand. Because um, that's where I believe it really comes together. We uh, engaged a professor from the University of Chicago some years ago to help us with this branding conundrum. We knew we were really great, and we really have really great people, but we really didn't know how to bring it together and express it. This ended up being our main and variable marketing dynamic. The main is reliable. You know, they pretty much expect it to be the print and on time. The responsive is the dynamic variable, and it's astounding how much value we built around that. And we even actually talk about it's our core competency. Our core competency doesn't have anything to do with exclusion. Our core competency is identifying, hiring, retaining, and developing our two people. That's our core competency. We know what our two people look like to us. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the organizational value chain. You, you all know this that uh, shareholder value is created by loyal customers, right? That's a no-brainer, but it's amazing how much execution falls by the way said. Who's on the team becomes extremely important because the right people are what to deliver value to the customer. So as I'm talking about this culture, which is nurturing and takes really good care of people, um, it can be easy to say, well, why are they doing that? Well, because those people take care of the customers and those customers take care of our financials. What does right mean for us? Reliable, responsive. That's the kind of people we look for. And we spend a tremendous amount of time during the interview process on that. We want people who are engaged. We want what we call problem um, solvers, not problem bringers. And we have specific sets of questions in our interviews um, we don't want people that feel like they're just a cork on the ocean and they go where the waves take them. We want people that identify a problem and then work to solve it. It all really begins with leadership. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Leadership creates the environment that people can try to do their best work. Now, you all know you probably read um, some of Xander Fulton's work. Uh, they're very good. And they actually have an article in this month's Harvard Business Review. You know about Jim Collins? You know we kept saying, don't tell me it's leadership. Don't tell me it's leadership. And his research assistants kept coming back and going, it's leadership. 
And finally, he built the whole notion around that. This is a very interesting man. Uh, when Governor Banger was governor, I got invited to a dinner where this was the guest of honor. And I really don't know how it worked out, but I sat next to him at dinner. And I was just making conversation. And I said, what's the number one problem with American business, in your opinion? He didn't even hesitate. He said, manage for the arrogance. <laughs> he said management arrogance and escalating value to bad decisions even in the face of import environmental input saying they are bad decisions. Why do you think it's really good to see that either with our government or with companies? I thought that was amazing. Management arrogance. Um, Goldman, you guys probably read a lot about him and about how he associates traits with leadership. Um, I thought I would show you this as a really outstanding example of leadership at its time. Oh, no, no, no. Billion dollar deal. Yeah, but uh, when I was coming through Bloomberg News and I saw J and J, you know, they were held up as example. All of you, blah blah blah. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I read this article. They had 150 product recalls. People had died as a result of all kinds of products. Um, birth control patches, hip replacements, you name it. And yet the CEO said. Any suggestion of a greater malaise is just Monday morning quarterback. It's just an aberration. And I thought, oh boy, that comes. Anyway, he got fired from this guy. Oh, you guys, we have to see that. Don't, don't right click. Now we want you to do this. Left click, either. Just left click. What? This arrow? No, 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 down. That one, left click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could open an account on FedEx.com, save 10% on online express shipping. Okay, how about this? We open an account on FedEx.com, we save 10% on online express shipping. <laughs> you just said the same thing I said, only you did this. No, I did this. It said that they had, uh, it had cost them more than a billion dollars and um, they had, had to shut plants down. Those are people's jobs. Okay, look to the bug strategy. These are our two strategic homes and we use in our balance scorecard. And you'd be glad, I'll give you our balance scorecard. You can look at it if you know. They're not complicated strategies, they're just do more of the stuff, sell more stuff, and everything we do, we call True North doing it better all the time. And um, every single layer of our company, from the bottom up, which uh, we believe our most important layer is our learning, innovation, and growth layer. It's all about our people. Here's uh, basically how it looks. We've got the strategy, competencies and systems. Do we have the right people? Do they have the right skills? Then we look at what processes we have to be good at, and then Basically, the most important is what our customers experience. This is it, not fully populated. But again, you notice that what we're saying here, we don't look at financial performance. Because one of the things I noticed in the companies I worked for is the financials were closed every month, and then the organizations was whipsawed around as they tried to figure out 
what to do about these unexpected results one way or another. And this whole system was developed by some guys like Walking Kaplan and, and Harvard. Interestingly enough, they're both electrical engineers, but they teach in a business school. And they basically said if you build your organization from the bottom up, the quality or the outcomes you want. So this is just a few little things to do with our customers. We sent out a card with every shipment. It's easy to answer that. Happy face, medium face, sad face. We get 85% return on that. Because we get these guys gifts for sending that. That's why they put so much detailed information about who they are. Um, we start, we call 20 customers a month and we have been doing it for years. We used to ask them a lot of questions that were our best guess at things mm -hmm. they value. And then we, I read an article in Harvard Business Review called The One Number to Need to Measure. And um, about, about Enterprise Rental Car and changed our surveys to just ask them, oh, would, you, would you recommend this and how would you do this? All right. So here he is saying it's just the future results of today's decisions. So why do companies fail to execute? I feel like um, my opinion is they fail to execute because they're not aligned. And alignment is mandatory. The alignment of people, how they see their purpose, how they see that they fit in, their motivation and inspiration are derived from being aligned. So an alignment of strategies and tactics through the balance scorecard, basically my belief is a company really can't execute the best of the ability without alignment. Because Business Magazine after Business Magazine will tell you that it's not lack of strategy, it's lack of execution. We also believe very highly in flexibility. Um, less, lack of flexibility is about fixedness. Uh, for example, we segment our markets and customers in very non-traditional ways. Um, we change processes at the work level, which could be perceived as lack of organizational control. But it's not. Read a book called Fly in Buffalo. It talks all about ownership at the lowest level. The example of flexibility is our thinking about HR. We believe HR is a set of skills, not a handbook. And I, I really do believe that a lot of companies hide behind their HR handbook. So when a company needs something that's a little bit off the grid, you know, and then they can point to item 12.3 as a reason why. Like, uh, but we believe HR is to hire and assimilate the right people. So what are the personal attributes? Uh, I've talked about the personal attributes that have yielded these results. What about the attributes of a culture that they have yielded? And these are the ones that we believe are the most important for us. Culture is it. We believe people need to be inspired and motivated. And when we close our company down a couple days a year and take them outside of the company, and I talk to them about this is just a little metal company in the first year, you know, probably pretty easy to feel like what you do doesn't matter. But think about all your families, all the families of the customers we ship to, all the customers that they ship to and their families. And we show maps of the U.S. and say, now tell us that what you do with this little metal company doesn't matter. We have to give people a sense of how they fit in. Xavier talks about that, of course. We do not believe that you can hire our two people and they're not communicate with them. They're, they will not have <coughs> So we will we communicate pretty robustly with our people. We believe in high levels of expectation, respect, trust, and yes, love. Let me tell you a tiny little story. So when I first came to work at Tutura, I had an assistant named Linnea. And long story, Linnea was a delightful girl. She now lives in Virginia with four little kids. She also happens to be a diabetic. She called me about two years ago. <coughs> My son brought me to phone and goes, there's someone named Linnea. And I said, oh, Linnea, yesterday was your birthday. Because that's not what I'm calling you. I'm calling you to tell you that 
But I was pregnant with my fifth child. I went into a diabetic coma. I was in a coma for six months. Blah, blah, blah. When I got out of that, I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And I'm doing pretty good, but there's a high chance I'm going to die. Now, she's 35 years old. Wow. And she said, the reason I'm calling you is it's really important to me that you know what you did for me and what you meant to me. And uh, she said, I always remember your very first day of work. You gave me something to fax. We used to fax then, mid-90s. Um, <laughs> she walked down the hall. You came back and said, did you fax that yet? She said, I sat there and thought, well, things are going to be different than I'm here. Oh, they are. I'm a much nicer person now. I'm softer. I'm more better to people. She said, no, no, no. What you did for every single person in that company was hold up a bar and then show us how to get over it. And you did that for me, and I wouldn't have got my college degree. I wouldn't have had these four kids because people had told me you can't do it. You're not about it. And so don't ever underestimate the power to affect just one person and make the world better through that. Um, we believe in high levels of trust. Another story, Antonio Moreira comes in and says, he worked for us 20 years. My mom died yesterday in Mexico City. I don't have any vacation. I don't have any family. So he left, and I said, Kara, um, would you buy him a round train from Mexico City? Pretty much sure. And she said, really? And I said, well, why? What do you do? He said, well, I know this is a really nice place, but don't you think that's all money? I said, we can scrap that much in the world you're not. She said, but then everyone else will be in here wanting to know where their plane ticket and their money is. I said, no, uh-uh, not at this point in time. Not with the trust we've built. Everyone will know Antonio got this, and the organization will have a collective nod of agreement, but what they will feel is that if I'm ever in dire straits, somebody might. Help me. I'll, I'll, I'll get my sprinkles. They might be different texture, color, but uh, we truly do have that kind of culture. Um, if you're done, you know, we have sales and in this birthday review. You somebody say, not to me, but with the people who do the birthday review monthly. You know, there have been a lot of decisions made in this company over the years that I didn't agree with, but I learned to trust, and it always turned out to be the right direction for us. So these, these are very important. Um, provide people more than they expect. That's the final organizational attribute. And you might think that's just kind of silly, but I can give you thousands of examples and what it means to people's lives and how committed they are to our customers as a result. Now the final thing, this isn't an organizational attribute. This is an attribute of leadership, the lack of opinion. Because paradox is in every single situation, every single day. And occasionally people are going to let you down. They're not going to pay their loan, or they're going to do something that's contrary to, to honorable behavior. But that doesn't mean give up the cultural attributes of provide people more than they expect, learn people's names. I've worked in companies where I, for, for a while, I thought everyone in the company was named Bud. <laughs> because that's what the plant manager told everybody as they walked through the lot. Hey, Bud. Hey, Bud. Hey, Bud. But Bud, Bud's really, you know, he's got a he's got family, he's got some problems, comes to work, he makes your parts. Uh, Bud deserves for you to know his name. Um, so, in final... We talk about organizations being comprised of, you know, disengaged people because of being driven by self-interest driven voluntary compliance. They come to work, they punch the time clock, they go in and they do their job, but their hearts and souls aren't there. But is it any wonder that that's the case um, when so many companies are, that are going down are having the CEOs that have failed them are getting these enormous golden parachute. What, what message is that? Because that CEO, rather than being driven by pride and responsibility, is driven by self-interest. So it's very important to focus on um, alignment from the top to the bottom. At its highest level, we succeed because of people. So companies don't make profits. When we talk about companies making profits, 
companies don't make profits. People make profits. And they make profits because they treat the environment they look in as though it's their profit. Now, um, I went over the time. I'm more than sorry. But um, hopefully there are a little bit of nuggets in here. But as you view life from the bottom up, and then you move up in organizations, you can use to build wonderful companies that people can look at. Or not, it's okay. Two questions. But, uh, can you say your core competencies? Uh, the ability to identify and hire and retain and develop what we call our people, reliable responses. Those are the traits we get to If those are our branding traits in the market, then those are the same traits we need our folks. We have a second sub-core competency. That is, we use our RTP to use their skills to create innovative solutions. <coughs> um, you said you were headhunted for this company when you were 29, right? No, 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 no. Oh. I said I was the president of the first company that I was president of, which ended up being a whole new ICT during that, at 29. Okay. How did, you, how did you prepare to become, like, go into that position at such a young age? I had no idea. Two jobs. Uh, I quickly learned that my CFO was going to be the most important guy that I had. Um, and I didn't. In fact, I only got the position because my boss, who had been a big wig with International Harvester, got fired because he wasn't producing results. And um, and this this company, before they sold us to Mac, was a Utah company, private Utah company. And needless to say, it was a little bit of an inspiration in our culture. I was on the board. And finally, they said, you know what? We're going to move you to this job. And I was like, okay. What I did know is that we were building two concrete trucks a week. And we hope to get where we're going to be building 20 a week. And so we need to get with it, streamlining our systems so that we could increase our capacity without very much. Typically, do you see the government as a hindrance or a help? Which <laughs> <laughs> See the federal government. Um, I don't think that uh, they're highly aligned with the objectives, the overall objectives in the country. You know, um, moving in Woodstock between um, issues that, that really don't fit to the core of our freedom and our liberty. And so I would guess I would have to say no, I don't see. I do. I mean, I. I'm mean, the here, so. <laughs> um, living so even down to the municipal level, we're in the city of Clearfield. Anybody's ever been in Clearfield? You've seen their their city offices, their new recreation complex. Um, well, guess what? They have the Freeport Center in their jurisdiction, and uh, we are the fatty calf, and yet. Try and get to anybody in who's going to talk to you. So I, I don't. I don't know what to do about. I'm pretty. I'm, I'm pretty upset about the government tax rate. You mentioned briefly about your, your journey in the a little bit about the columns and all that. You brought that to the company. We brought it to the company as a group because what well, was the next thing? So. What Job. And it's got a very big suite of things to look at and be fixed. Um, so we liken it to a river, and it's got rocks in it. So the first rocks you deal with are the ones sticking out of the water. And then as the water level starts to lower, new rocks stick out. So we tended to work on the issues that were the most pressing, and um, which was leadership and management. And leaning was way down the list. But we both we constantly talk in terms of the next best set of opportunities in our market. This can't do everything at once. One more question. Um, so I look at the long term a lot. And every, I know you see you talk about it. It's a huge risk. It's great to do that by spending a couple hundred dollars and spending a couple hundred dollars. How do you make sure that you stay up for the short term? Right. We can do 
long that really is. We have lots of now of a big shock absorbing But in the early days, it was a fault. I was basically very busy ascertaining who was going to scale the team and who wasn't. And we weren't doing a lot. But I've had a lot of time to build trust where now we can introduce and think about things like that without it causing internal strife in the company. Susan, thank you very much.